So in this series that we're calling The Grinch, the Grinch had a problem that his heart was two or three sizes too small. And so we're looking in the book of Isaiah, and one of the predictions about Jesus by a man named Isaiah, of who he is as this uh, man named Jesus, and the character that he has uh, that helps hearts grow. And and so in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, this prediction, of who Jesus is, what he's going to be like, what we can expect from Jesus when he's in present with us or we're paying attention to him, uh, gives us four different names. And so let's put it up there and let's read this together out loud. Ready? One, two, three, go. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And so last week, we looked at that first name, uh, ever, our Wonderful Counselor, and this week we're going to move on to the second one, Mighty God. And to kick us off, here, here's a question for you. What did it take, if it happens already and it's in the past for you, or what would it take, if it has not happened for you, to make the declaration Surely, surely you are the Son of God. So what would it take in your life for you to be sitting there or experiencing this, what's going on? What would it take for you to sit, as a result of that, say, wow, yeah, Jesus, surely you are the Son of God. Maybe it happened in the past and there was an event or something that happened or a sequence of events and you just like, ooh, yes, surely, Jesus, you are the Son of God, and I'm going to let you be that in my life. Maybe that hasn't happened yet. What would it take? What would he have to do? What would you have to experience for you to say, surely, you are the Son of God? We're in Matthew chapter 14, and we're going to look at an experience where some of his followers made that declaration. And so before we read that, let's get some background on it. Last week, as we were talking about Wonderful Counselor, we looked at a map of a journey that Jesus took from one segment to the other. And so down there in kind of that reddish color, Judea uh, area you see, there's where Jerusalem's at. Um, That is one section where Jesus spent quite a bit of time on his three years of ministry in his life. And then there's a section where the arrows are all pointing up in the top portion called Galilee, another section where Jesus spent a significant amount of time in his life and his ministry here on earth. And so this morning, the uh, the story we're going to look at, the experience of Jesus' life, comes from that top section. And in that top section, you see the red section, Galilee, you see the, the, the the blue circle next to it, meaning that lake, the Sea of Galilee, and, uh, and that's where we are at, looking at the Sea of Galilee. And so here's what's happened so far in Jesus' life. Jesus has fed fed 5,000 people with one person's lunch. He's raised a dead girl back to life. He's healed the sick, the blind, the mute, and the paralyzed. The disciples were there for almost all of it, and then through all of that, they never said, or recorded in Scripture, where they said, surely you are the Son of God. But there's one event that he did that. So the background setting that up is Jesus has already sent out his disciples two by two to go to places where he's going to go. And they went there with specific instructions to heal, to cast out demons, and to teach people about Jesus. And they did that. And they've come back with great excitement, great joy, because they got to see amazing things happen. This is the first time they've got to practice outside of the presence of Jesus the things that he has taught them. And so they come back all pumped up. While they're gone, or about that same time, Jesus' cousin and the one that came before him, John the Baptist, was killed, murdered by King Herod, and word had gotten to Jesus. And so you see all this mixture of emotions in Jesus happening, this incredible sadness at the loss of his cousin, of his friend, of the one who's gone before him, and this incredible joy of seeing the followers that he's been pouring his life into come back and say, oh my goodness, it worked. Like the things you told us to do, like it actually happened, people were healed, and all this crazy stuff happened. And so you've got these huge swings of emotions going on in Jesus, and he says to his disciples, let's just get away. Let's get away. Let's get away, let's rest, let's reconnect to the Father. Let's just, let's get away by ourselves. And so they they get on a boat on one side of the lake, and they start going to the other. But you see from that picture, this is actually a picture of the Sea of Galilee. The Sea of Galilee is not a huge lake. It's like 
a hundred times smaller than Lake Erie is. Eight miles, 13 miles, not huge. And it's also bordered around, especially on over half of it, by these tall hills, almost mountains. And so people can actually like look out on the lake and see where boats are headed. And so people knew Jesus and his disciples got in a boat and started to head across. And so they see where the boat's headed and they start to go around the outside of the lake and they actually get there before they do. And so as the disciples and Jesus get out of the boat, they have a welcoming committee of all these people. We'll talk about this story there next week. But after that, Jesus teaches all day long, all night long, just invests in them, feeds them, And then by the end, he's ready to do something different. So let's read verse 22 of chapter 14. So he's just taught all these disciples, all these people. He's had compassion on them. He's fed them dinner. And it says, Immediately Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side. While he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night, he was alone. And the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by waves because the wind was against it. Let's pause there. So Jesus is still has this desire to get away with his disciples. Let's get away, let's get away from them. So right after all of this craziness of this teaching, of this feeding of all these people, he says to the disciples, hey, I'm going to finish up here. You guys get in the boat and go. If I'm here finishing up and you guys are going, they won't be able to get around and do this whole thing again. So you guys go, I'll finish up here. So he finishes up, he dismisses the crowds, they all start to leave, and he goes up into one of those mountains there, because he does this a lot, spend time with his father. And he goes up there to pray, but from his perch of his praying, he can also see out over the water. And he sees out over the water that a storm's brewing, and the disciples are caught in it. The storm. Interesting thing about this lake it's very shallow, it's not very deep. And so as wind whips over those mountains and the cold air from on top merges with the warm air down by the water, storms pop up quick here. And they're violent because the water doesn't go deep where the water energy can get absorbed down in the depths of the water. Waves build up really quick. And even these guys who are fishermen, professional fishermen, find themselves all of a sudden in a very tough place on the water. People were always warned about this sea because of how scary these storms can get and how quickly they can go. In the Bible, water represents life. It's required for life. But also, throughout the pages of Scripture, we see that water also represents chaos and storms. And so if you think through the whole picture of the Bible... The great flood found in Genesis, the chaos of water and the destructive, destructive nature of water when it's uncontrolled. Jonah, when he's going the wrong direction, the storm that pops up when, and he's trying to get away from God is the thing that God pulls him back to himself. It's chaos. Even the professional sailors, they were like, ah, what's going to happen? The storm the disciples and Jesus found themselves in earlier where he slept through the whole thing. Water is often used as a way to explain chaos, storms of life. Because we have storms and chaos in our lives. You have storms and chaos in your life. Maybe it's a diagnosis. Maybe it's relationship troubles. Maybe it's financial troubles. Maybe it's work problems or a lack of work. Maybe your character is being attacked undeservingly. At some point, we find ourselves, and the wind picks up, the waves start to grow, and they beat against your life, and the boat of your life starts to rock. And you find yourself in these places of just storms. Let's keep reading and see what happens. In verse 25, shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them, walking on the the lake. 
When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and they cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and began to sink. And he cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? And when they climbed in the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. Did you pick up the first line of verse 25? Shortly before dawn. So I don't know how long the disciples have been out there. I don't know. It may have been all night long or a majority of the night they're out trying to row and to get this boat to go across the water. Exhaustion and all those things starting to set in. But sometime right before dawn, as they're struggling out there, Jesus from his perch goes, okay, I'm going to go join him, and comes out of the mountain and just starts to walk across the water. Waves still going, wind still blowing, storm still all around them, and he's just marching through it. And as he gets closer to the disciples, disciples already on nerves start to see this figure, this thing out on the water, and they have the natural reaction of, ah, it's a ghost! And they squash the panic button even greater than they already are. And Jesus, in his compassion, says, take courage, change your pants, it's just me. I, I love Peter. He, he's, he's the one that says what everyone's thinking, but is too afraid to say it. He's the one that does the things that probably everyone else dreams they could, but just too afraid to give it a try. And he sees Jesus walking on this water in the middle of the storm, and he's like, oh, that would be sweet. Call me out there, Jesus. Bitch, you call me out there. And Jesus says, come on, give it a try. And there, there goes Peter, tromping on water. We don't know how many steps he got. But as long as he was focused in on Jesus, he was fine. But then he got distracted by the storm and the waves and the chaos and the challenges. And as soon as his eyes left Jesus and went down to the storm, his footing didn't hold and he begins to sink into the water. And it saved me. And we can look at Jesus and say, man, what a rebuke, what a challenge. Like, why didn't you have faith? Could. Or it could have been a gentle whisper as he's pulling out, like, man, you were doing it. Why did you lack the faith? You were experiencing it. You were walking on the water. Why did you lack the faith? Why did you have doubt? But he picks him up. Puts him, helps him get in the boat, and as soon as Jesus steps foot in the boat, the storm's gone. I would think that would qualify for me as something I would say, ooh, surely you are the Son of God. Surely you are the Son of God. You are the mighty God, the one who walks through storms, and sometimes even calms the storms. See, you and I have storms. We have chaos. Where does our eyes focus in the chaos? Where do your eyes automatically or quickly go to in the storms, in the chaos, in the challenges of life? Does the eyes get drawn to Jesus, or do your eyes start looking elsewhere for fixes and for things that can get you out of the storm. When you start to not feel well and you think, man, this might just not be something small, this may be something larger, where do you turn? Is the first step 
to run to doctors or is the first step to run to prayer? I'm not saying we shouldn't go to doctors. We should. But I think we should pray. When financial challenges hits, what's the first thing you do? Is it that you run to advisors or is it you run to some way to fix this issue or is it I run to mighty God the one who can handle the problems and the storms and the chaos of my life relationship issues people attacking my character or whatever it is that we face where do we run to first do we run to someone or something or some fix? Do we pull ourselves up by our bootstraps and try to figure out how we can just navigate our way through this? Or do we turn to the one who walks on water and calms the storm? Isaiah in the Old Testament also says some other things in verse 43. It says, but now, this is what the Lord says. He who created you, Jacob. He who formed you, Israel. Do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name, and you are mine. Now, notice the next word. What's that word say? So it doesn't say if, huh? Doesn't say if? No if there, huh? When you pass through the waters... I'll be with you. And what's the next word? And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. Once again, using water as the metaphor of chaos and of storms of life. When you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. And when you walk through fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. You know, there's great times where we need a wonderful counselor. We need someone who has been there who can help guide us through it. But there's also times where we need a mighty God. One that can walk through all of this raging waters and through the storms and the fires can walk right through it with us. And then also by the sound of his voice and the command can all of a sudden calm them. We need a mighty God. And that's who Jesus is. In the New Testament, Paul writing to a group in a town called Philippi about Jesus. In Philippians 2 says this, Therefore, God exalted him, that's Jesus, to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's the one who comes at Christmas. That's the one who came to be among us. That's the one who came to live with flesh on to show us the way to live in relationship with God. Not just to be a model, but also to be a powerful force that can change the storms and calm the storms and help us walk through the storms that we find in our life. Now be careful. Be careful because he is a mighty God. He is a mighty God. If he's got the power to calm the storms, he also has the power, like our welcome in word verse says, to refine and to purify and to call us into a life of absolute devotion to him. That's the mighty God known as Jesus. Jesus as the mighty God, sometimes walks through the storms with us and other times calms the storms. And so here's the question. What storm are you facing right now? What storm are you facing right now? What do you need the mighty God to walk, with through, you, walk through with you? What do you need to ask the mighty God that if he could and if he would, would calm this storm and quiet this storm in your life. What is it that you need? We've been invited to approach him with boldness. We've been invited to approach him without fear because the mighty God is the wonderful counselor who cares for you and me. So as we respond this morning, we ask three questions here. What did you hear? How can you respond? Who can you share it with? And so as we respond, I'm going to pray 
band's going to come out, we're going to sing through a song, but I invite you to respond, not to us, but respond to God. Respond to the mighty God, the one who calms storms. And so if you found yourself this morning, you're like, ooh, the waves are getting high. It's a little crazy right now. I invite you to respond to him and ask, mighty God, would you walk through this with me? And would you calm it in my life? I don't understand why sometimes he calms storms through healing or restoration or reconciliation, and sometimes it doesn't happen the way we want it to. I don't understand that. But this is what we are promised, that when it doesn't get calmed right away in life like we want it to, he walks with us through the storm. We're not alone. So I'm going to ask you to stand with me. If as you're responding to God this morning and confessing or acknowledging what storm you're going through and what help you need, uh, if you want a place where people can pray with you, I invite you to come down here to the altar and, uh, and pray. It's open during this time. The Lord, nothing special about these benches. But the Lord does work here and doesn't do it there. But this is what happens. It's a place to lean on God. And it's a place to lean on each other. And so I invite you as you respond, if you want to come forward, you're welcome to do so. Kind Father, we thank you. We thank you that you are the mighty God. That the storms and the chaos of our life is not outside or beyond you or... And it doesn't have you confused or wringing your hands figuring out what's going to happen next. And so right now we turn to you. And around this room we're acknowledging the storms that we're facing right now. Us being sick, loved ones being sick. Loved ones in rebellion right now, going directions that we just know are not pleasing to you and are not good for themselves. Relationships on the verge of breaking are already broken. Whispers and rumors and different things about our character that just makes us look not good to others. Hurts and wounds from the words that we've heard. And as we look around, the waves are starting to raise up. And the clouds are pretty dark, and lightning's coming, and rain, and all this mess. We need our mighty God. So, Lord, would you come in and would you calm the storms that we have? And in the meantime, would you walk with the, us through these storms, helping us to recognize we're not alone, and you are the one who can carry us through.